For over 30 years, the consumer survivor ex-patient movement has been fighting for human rights and social justice for people who've been diagnosed with mental illness. To be effective leaders in our movement, it is important that we know our history. You see, history is not something that is a fact and that exists in the past. History has not ended. History is still unfolding right now in the present. When you get right down to it, history is a story. But who gets to tell the story and who is silenced? Whose experience gets recorded and whose story is erased? Whose reality is affirmed and whose is denied? That is a matter of the politics of memory. A good example of the politics of memory is the holiday we call Columbus Day. I mean, let's face it, Columbus did not discover America. In fact, not only did Columbus fail to discover America, but he is directly responsible for the genocide of the island people known as the Arawak. So why does our entire nation participate in the mass delusion that we call Columbus Day? Why are our kids still being taught about those three little ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria? Why are our kids still being taught that Christopher stepped out onto the beach and claimed the new world for his god and queen while all those brown-skinned savages looked on in deep appreciation of the prospect of becoming civilized. Whose memory is this? I suspect it's not the memory of indigenous peoples. The example of Columbus Day helps us to see that there is a politic to memory. The word politic comes from the same Latin root as the words polite and police. Politic, polite, police. It's more politic to speak of Columbus Day than genocidal colonialism. It is more polite to remember the little ships than to remember the agony of the slaves hauled in the belly of such ships and such polite polemic is policed and enforced such that any other memory or story is pushed to the fringe of public perception. Most mental health professionals also tell a story that is politic, polite, and policed. It is a dominant and dominating narrative in which they define themselves and their work. It is a story that does not include the perspective of ex-patients, yet tries to speak for us and to define us and our experience. It is a master narrative and we are its slaves until we dare to examine history, to find the lost stories, and to retell history as our story. So let's begin with the Columbus Day type story that professionals tell. The master narrative that most professionals tell is one of progress and the triumph of empiricism over superstition and ignorance. It is a story of faith in science and advances in technology. The master narrative goes something like this. In the 1700s, Lunatics were viewed as a subhuman species, indifferent to cold or heat, more like poorly cared for animals than human beings. The story continues. The French physician Pinel struck off the chains of mental patients, helping to usher in a new understanding of the lunatic as a human being who could be restored to reason. In the same century, here in the United States, Benjamin Rush opened the first unit for lunatics in a general hospital at the Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia. Benjamin Rush, known as the father of American psychiatry, invented the tranquilizing chair. The word tranquilizer entered the English language as a result of this device. The master narrative continues and says that in the 1800s, the era of moral treatment ushered in the establishment of lunatic asylums, 
created for the cure of insanity. Here you see the palatial gardens created at Danvers State Hospital in Massachusetts when it opened in 1878. These extravagant gardens were intended to be places of beauty that would quiet the mind and eventually help cure lunatics. Gardens such as these were a reflection of the optimism for cure that marked the attitude of many of the first superintendents in the 1800s. Through the proliferation of insane asylums, psychiatry established itself as a profession. Here are the first members of what would later become the American Psychiatric Association. They were all superintendents of institutions for the insane. In private, these first members of the APA would refer to themselves as the Brethren. The story continues that the asylum soon became overcrowded. Professionals bravely persevered and managed to keep institutions operating despite more and more patients and less and less money. The master narrative even admits to using desperate measures to cure patients, including metrazole shock, insulin shock, and electroshock as well as the brain mutilating treatment called psychosurgery performed on tens of thousands of inmates in state and private hospitals around the country. Thorazine arrived in the early 1950s and the modern drug revolution in biological psychiatry was underway. Of course, the master narrative fails to mention what one ex-patient told me, that Thorazine came at about the same time that the potent tranquilizer called television was brought onto his ward at the state hospital. He couldn't tell if it was the TV or the Thorazine that quieted things down. And the story continues right on through to the present day with the so-called new generation of wonder drugs, such as Clozaril. And the suggestion in this Eli Lilly drug advertisement that maybe in the future, hope itself will be bottled and sold. This master narrative, this sanitized story that leaves out the ex-patient perspective is not the whole story. Ex-patients have a story to tell. We have a collective heritage to discover, retell, and celebrate. What is our story? How do we retell our story? Where do we even begin to find our history? These were the questions I asked myself a few years ago, and I found that sometimes our story is one of agony, told his fingernails scratched into seclusion room doors. Sometimes our story is one of defiance, of leaving a mark, a name, a testament to the human being who suffered in this seclusion room. And this seclusion room. Our story is one of anger, told in graffiti, emblazoned on the outside of state hospitals. Angry, very angry. And the story always has a humorous side. Shrinks or quacks. Sometimes our story is written secretly, as if in code. For instance, here is a display from a psychiatric museum. The display contains a white state hospital sheet on which a woman diagnosed with chronic schizophrenia had embroidered words. The sign next to the display explains that the embroidered words illustrate schizophrenic thinking. Let's look closer at the woman's supposedly schizophrenic thinking. To have, to hold, and to love.
Wait for me. Are you coming? I love you. Christmas. I am lonely. And this story. Where the master narrative sees signs of schizophrenic thinking, we see a woman abandoned in a mental institution, struggling with deep emotions and questions such as, I am lonely, and are you coming? Perhaps that is why we have historically called them shrinks. To be able to see a woman as a disease, to call her expression of feeling schizophrenia, to shrink the context of her life, to shrink the meaning of her pain, and to shrink the significance of her life experience. The master narrative shrinks us into disease categories. As leaders, we have a choice. When we speak in public, we can support the master narrative, shrink our humanity to a diagnosis, and say, I am a schizophrenic, I am a bipolar, I am a borderline. Or we can tell a new story. I am a person, not an illness. <laughs>